Thank you, Florian, for the very kind introduction, and thanks to the organizers for having me. I'm thrilled to talk in front of such a keen audience, and I hope you get something out of it today. All right, so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on explaining what Gurobi is. I'm going to put into context of uh, prescriptive analytics, then I'll dive a little bit more technical, going towards what is actually mathematical optimization. Um, I'll give you a good example, a very simple one, semi-contrived, I would say, on project team assignment. Um, I'll walk you through a couple of open source offerings we're having at Gorobi, um, data-driven optimization examples, and finally conclude with um, an adversarial machine learning example where optimization plays a surprisingly interesting role. All right, so what is Gorobi? So Gorobi is a commercial solver engine for mathematical optimization problems. Um, we are a worldwide, uh, all remote, from the start company, uh, founded in 2008. Um, our software is pretty uh, deployment friendly, from laptop to data center or just via, via our cloud service. Um, it's free for academia and free for uh, non-profit. And we, we position ourselves in the, in the realm of prescriptive analytics, so unlike predictive analytics, which tries to get some insight into how may future data look like from past data that I know, we take the prediction and based on that, take optimal decisions to make business, um, it, to solve business problems in the future. So, Gorobi is a prescriptive analytics tool. And uh, yeah, as, as, as uh, you could have guessed, we're not like a small smart startup. We, are, we have uh, 3,000 plus uh, global customers uh, across various industries. Um, if you are not so much from the technical side, but more from the business side, check out all the, the case studies we have on our website to give you an idea where Gorobi may fit into your business. Um, for the more technically oriented, so we, we are not a consulting company where we don't have a, in, an application-specific framework that allows you to, say, solve supply chain problems or logistics problems or whatever. No, we, we, we throw you the engine for the car. We throw it over the fence and then you build the car around it or you have consulting partners to help you succeed with that. That said, everything's implemented in C, so I'm, that's how I spend my day. I sit in my basement hacking on C algorithms and the code and uh, the result is this, this library. Um, yep, that's it. How do you use Gorobi in practice? Well, you, you do what you do, you pip install Gorobi Pi. That's, that's what I would say more than 80% of our customers are doing. But for sure we have APIs for, for most of the um, popular languages. Well, notably missing is Rust. I know there's a Rust intersection of Python Rust fan base here, even in this room. But we are, we're not, not there yet. Too, too few commercial customers in the Rust space, I guess. Um, we have a couple of more interesting packages to play with. We have Groby by Pandas, which makes it um, terribly easy to build optimization models directly from Pandas data. We have Groby Machine Learning that allows you to integrate trained regressors in, as constraints into optimization models. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. And yeah, so if you are from the traditionalist side, so of course, Groby is also accessible via all the existing infrastructure tools in the optimization space, AIMS, Ample, GAMS, MPL, and uh, CVX, Payomo, Pulp, Jump, Google R tools, you name it. Typically, all these tools will offer you to use Groby in the back end. Okay, so what is prescriptive analytics anyway? Let's approach it from uh, a couple of use cases. So uh, the NFL, of course, a big thing in the US, and um, Designing a schedule for the season plan of the NFL is a, an enormously challenging problem. So in the end, if you know all the data in advance, but you know what are, what are the teams, who will meet against, who will meet which team when, okay? So, but you have to arrange the exact timings, the locations, and there are enormously complicated constraints because it's so highly commercialized, NFL. So you have to take into account what do the broadcasting agencies, what are the requirements for them to, um, to allow a game. You have free agent, which changes mid-season the composition of the teams, and then you cannot send the same team three consecutive days in away games uh, somewhere else. It doesn't work. So in the end, NFL uses Gorobi to create a season plan. So that's their business problem. They solve it that way. Uh, France is just uh, it's an, it's an important customer for us, a very good customer. So um, 
I'm sure many of you travel a lot, so um, I, I think you, you notice that if you hop on a plane, that plane will just not go back and forth, back and forth between the same two um, locations. It will hop actually on a, on, a, on a circular rotation until it hits maintenance time and then goes to maintenance. So that's in the undisturbed case, right? There can always be like um, exceptions and then you can reschedule. But typically, you have a rotation plan. And well, how do you, how do you, so you have your flight plan from this is the business input and you have to solve the problem which plane serves which leg at which point in time. And you need to do this by um, respecting fuel constraints. You need to utilize your, f your fleet. You don't want to have airplanes sitting on the ground because on the ground, airplane just costs money and doesn't do anything. You want to minimize fuel consumption for, for obvious reasons and operational costs like crew scheduling. You don't want to have empty flights. You don't want to bring crew just to fly the plane empty back. That doesn't make any sense. So it's a highly complicated scheduling problem and uh, France uses Grobi to, to do this. Uh, third and last um, case study, um, if you, uh, if you're on, on, on the farming side, you have to, you have to somehow, you have to make multiple passes over your, over your fields to uh, either seed crops or to maintain or to whatever do you need to do. So there's always a routing problem. How do I, how, how do I, tra how do I traverse this field? And do you have boundary restriction? How much, how much from the edge do you, are you allowed to, to drive? How many turns? Uh, should you minimize the turns? Should you minimize the distance? Should you minimize the, the fuel? So um, Virch is a company that, that has um, an, an app uh, for half, essentially for farmers in the end, to, to help them designing the optimal routings uh, on their fields. So that's another happy customer with Gorobi. All right, so what makes them all happy? It's uh, mathematical optimization that makes them happy in the end. Um, if you haven't heard of it, let me, let me, let me start with a completely non-technical uh, verbiage on that. So there are typically three major components in optimization problems. Uh, number one is decision variables. So that is the thing you want to get out of the optimization problem. You want to have a decision, what should I do? So here are three examples. Should I stock cat litter boxes in fulfillment center Ludwigsfelde, south of Berlin here, uh, from Habschkeuditz, which is the airport near Leipzig? As or no, you could, you, you could also stock it from Amsterdam, you can stock it from Warsaw, so plenty of choices. So that's, that's a decision that you would like the optimization problem to, get, to give to you. Yeah, you should do that because that's best, all right? Another example, if I'm investing into, into stocks, how much should I put into NVIDIA? Well, if we had been uh, 15 years back, probably 100%, we are now sure, but we, of course, we cannot, we cannot um, die back time, but that's a decision problem you want to take. What, what should I invest? Uh, or another classical scheduling problem, should I assign Robert's talk to room B09 at Wednesday 10.30? That's, you have to plan a conference, you have to plan who speaks where when. So that's a decision that you want the mathematical optimization problem for, uh, to take for you. Second important component, you have decision variables, granted. Now it's about what do you want to optimize? So, and this is a key performance indicator you typically put in. So in the first example with the cat litter boxes, what you want is you want to minimize the total transportation cost. That was the shipping example. Or in the, in the case of portfolio optimization, you want to minimize the expected, so the expected value of the risk for your portfolio of investments. Or for the third example, you could say, well, here PyCon, where we're not allowed a speaker to, 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 to voice preferences, but other conferences do, so it's a bit contrived. So, what is, what is the conference schedule that maximizes the speaker happiness in terms of timings? So that would, that would be the objective to me. All these are key performance indicators. Finally, and the third thing, that and this is, makes it very, very different from, from just, oh, but I use stochastic gradient descent to solve my problem. So here's the thing that makes mathematical optimization much, much different. Uh, you can enforce constraints on the decisions. So you can say, with the replenish, uh, with the um, fulfillment of demand of cat litter boxes in uh, Ludwigsfelde, I must meet the predicted demand. A solution that does not meet the demand is not feasible and hence cannot be considered among the choice. Or you could say, yeah, if I'm into portfolio optimization and you know whenever you open a position, you pay a transaction cost. And that's typically not desirable to have like 1,000 tiny positions open 
because you pay 1,000 times the transaction cost for that. You say, okay, give me the best possible solution under the restriction that I invest only in 20 different assets, and among these, minimize the risk. Or for scheduling, well, there's a very, very obvious constraint that you definitely want to put. Each room can host only at most one session at a time. I mean, it would be nice to have like a peer standing next to me, but it's kind of async, that doesn't work. Okay, good. Now for the, for the more tech-oriented uh, math notation uh, people in the room, so this is, this is uh, the essence of what I just said. Anything, any business problem that you can translate into, hey, I have decision variables, I have linear constraints, I have inequalities, so these are uh, optimization problems in standard form. Of course, you can have inequality constraints, AX less or equal than B or whatever. Um, anything you can f uh, phrase into this framework is what our solver then eats. And I want to point out one specific thing here, which is the um, integrality restriction here, right? This is something that, this is a differentiating factor for um, our uh, mixed integer optimization. So you can enforce on the decision variables that variables may only take binary or generally integer variables. Right? You cannot, you cannot send three and a half trucks from Schkeuditz to Ludwigsfelder. This doesn't work, even it would be optimal. You have to settle the question, should it be three or four? And the solver takes the decision for you and gives you a guaranteed globally optimal solution for that. It's not heuristic, it's, it's guaranteed. All right, and then you can, you, can, you can put twists and turns on top of it. Mixed integer quadratically constrained optimization problems, mixed integer non-linear, non-convex problems, and so forth. You can, you can go through with the whole uh, taxonomy of optimization problems, and typically Groby will be able to solve them. Okay, um, I want to do one full example from model to code that you have seen at least one thing concrete. I cannot put the most, the most complex thing here on the slides in a couple of the few minutes I have. I, I still hope you get the essence out of it. So the setting we're, we're having here is we're running a fantasy consulting company and we have a fixed set of teams. So this is uh, indexed by the set J and we have a set of projects I that a way to be worked on. And now we have to decide which team should be assigned to which project. And so let's check out what is the data. So first of all, for every project on the board, we do have an expected profit. So this is the money we get from completing the project. Then um, we also have a resource requirement for each project, which is like how many, how many person weeks does this project uh, take? So like senior consultant says, yeah, I would say it's two and a half person weeks. And then that's the number you get as input, all right? Then you have a capacity of the team, right? You cannot put all the work into one team because the team has maybe only capacity for 10 person weeks of projects. All right, so this is the data you get in. Then you have decision variables, and that's pretty obvious. So these are binary variables, and that indicates, should project I be assigned to team J? If it's zero, it's no. If it's one, yes. That assignment is optimal, okay? What is the objective function? Well, we want to maximize the profit from all completed projects. It doesn't mean we need to do all. Well, if we, if we would be able to do all, then there's no optimization. We just do everything, fine. But we want to select, right? So what, what is the optimal assignment of projects so that we maximize the fantasy con uh, consulting company's profit? And there are constraints. So we cannot oversubscribe the teams. We cannot put everything on the most efficient or the most uh, or one team. Each team has uh, capacity uh, to, to work on. And finally, at most, one team works on each project. So even though we may have a project that is extremely profitable, that we cannot complete it 10 times by 10 different teams. Only one team can work on it. And if you, what I just put out in, 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 uh, in, in, in verbs, um, yeah, so this is the mathematical formulation we get out of it. Like you maximize the sum over the profits, pending assignments, Subject to the capacity for all teams is met, and each project is assigned at least uh, at most once. And of course, half a half an assignment doesn't make sense, so this is a binary decision variable. All right. So how does it look? The input data we have three. We have, we have two theories and one data frame. One for the resource of each project, one for the capacity for each team, and finally for each admissible. Uh, matching between project and team, so there's a pandas multi-index here, 
we have a profit we can put into it. All right. So don't don't get don't be disappointed that you get lost in the data. Um, I'll walk you through as good as I can. So and how does it look in the code? First thing, you import our libraries. So GrowPy is our standard. Um, it's our wrapper around the C library, and then the GrowPy pandas is our um, convenience tool. This also acts, registers automatically as an ex, uh, the, the accessor API of pandas. So you'll see some magic coming out of it in a bit. You create an optimization model. So this is the container data structure more or less to hold constraints, variables, and so forth, and to query the solution in the end. You could either maximize or minimize. Here you want to maximize. It's mathematically the same thing, right? Maximizing the minus of something is the same as minimizing it. So it's not, not but we here in that case we want to maximize. So and here goes the thing that is important. So the project values, this is the multi-index data frame with the, with the profits in it. We go through the accessor GPBD and say add variables. And this will add the decision variables that I talked about earlier. Stuff it into the model. They have the type binary and the objective function coefficients. So this is the profits we get of it. Uh, it should read them out directly from the data frame from the profit column. And then there's also some descriptive name. And you see what happened here. So we had the, this is the multi-index. This is the data we had in the data frame. And now we got another data frame that has attached another column with the decision, decision variables. And so x, p2, t, t0 is the decision variable for should project 2 be tackled by team zero. So and we ask in the end the optimate the solver, should it be zero or should it be one? That's the ultimate question we will answer in the end. All right. And you, you build up the model uh, by similar con uh, constructs uh, further. So now the resource constraint. Here you broadcast the project resources along the missing dimension of the multi-index to the assignment variables. You group by team, sum it up. And guess what? You want to bound the sum by the total team capacity. So that's what we want. Like each teams cannot be oversubscribed. That that's what's happening here in the code. All right. Finally, last constraint. Now we do the the aggregate sum uh, paradigm the other way around. This time we take the assignment variable, group by project, and sum it up, and say yeah, that must be at most one. And that's the whole model in the end. What we now now do is we call model dot optimize. This will solve in a split second for like a toy problem like this. That's like. 10 teams and 50 project, 15 projects. I don't know, this is, this is ridiculous, but it's a nice toy example. And then uh, we need to query the solution. So we, we go to the assignments, which were the decision variables, get that column out of it. This is now a series. Go through the pandas accessor, query the Gorobi attribute x, which is a shorthand for the optimal solution values. Put it in the frame, reset index, select, da 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 da. And since these variables were binary, we can just query for a greater or equal zero dot nine. That's just some number. So you know this is still a numeric algorithm. So there's an integrality tolerance of like ten to the minus fifth or something. So querying exactly one dot zero may just uh, not uh, work well with that uh, tiny tolerance. So better safe than sorry. Just query greater than zero dot nine. Then what comes out of that is definitely zero or one for all what makes uh, sense here. All right. We group by an aggregate and finally. What we got is the, um, the schedule. So this is a, a series with uh, a data frame with, with uh, the schedule we have. So each team has now a list of projects to work on. And the solver is guaranteed that this is the optimal assignment for these project team combinations. All right, that was my contrived little example. Now I walk you through a little more high level on other open source tools we have. So the first is the, the Gurobi Optimods. So an Optimod is a tool to solve a specific practical problem. It has a data-driven API for common optimization problem. It takes data in natural form, returns to natural form, and solves in, in the back end. You won't notice it uses Gorobi to do this. So maybe if you have like a STEM or MINT background from university, you may have seen some of these projects, uh, some of these problems here, like maximum bipolar matching or maximum weighted set. This is typical what you, what you learn in, in, in computer science and when it comes to discrete problems somehow, or optimal power flow. I know that many people in the power industry actually here, so that's, that's a big, big thing for us and for, for society actually in general, how to do that. Or Cubo, recent, due to the quantum hype, people are talking about Cubo, so we have something for that. Um, so these are data-driven APIs. So this is, you should think about these Optimods as Examples 
on how to leverage technology, uh, optimization technology into your business. So you take it in the back end and the front end you communicate with data in, solution out. And that is how it's in. So one example, quick. So many of you may know um, from uh, scikit-learn like the, the um, ordinarily squares regressor. So this is just the two norm of the uh, regression error that you want to minimize, right? This is linear algebra more or less. So here we have an alternative which does not look at the two norm but at the one norm. I'll, I'll show in a bit why, why this actually makes a difference. And so what comes from Gorobi Optimots is you import the, um, the regression module, you um, instantiate it, you train it, and then you um, get the, the predicted, uh, you get the uh, regression weights back by predicting your, your test data. This is all the standard workflow you, you have to do for regression problems with scikit-learn anyway. So that way I meant takes input and in natural form. So you do it exactly like you would do with scikit-learn, but in the back end it doesn't use scikit-learn, it uses Gorobi to solve the problem. So and why, why is this one norm thing actually interesting? So I noticed that while playing around a little bit with that. So the thing is that if you take the one norm instead of the two norm, that's much more resistant to outliers. Like you, you, um, somebody enters an Excel sheet with the BMI of certain test people and then they, they just flip two numbers. Of course, it doesn't make sense for the BMI in most of the cases. So that's a typical outlier that, that happens on the sparse cases into the data. So and here I've done a nice comparison. So in blue, we have original data. And in orange, I've added some, some few random gross outliers into the trainings data set. And the, by using absolute value as um, the regression uh, paradigm, you, you avoid that your regression coefficients change a lot because in the two norm, right, there's the square in it. So if you have anything with large deviation, this will hit extra hard because you square the error essentially. So th this just shows for if you expect your data to have random few outliers, better not use ordinary least squares. Think about something using more rob or rob robustified any other way, like you have the other techniques, but least absolute value deviation is for me the, the easiest one. Anyway, final topic, um, using trained regressors as constraints. So as part of the key components for optimization problems, um, I featured that, yeah, the, you have to put constraints like um, no room can be used twice at the same time. So how about if we don't put linear constraints or linear inequalities as, as I've shown my examples, but instead we input um, a trained regressor. So what does it mean? So we take any package to train a, a regression model and then instead of just predicting values, we say, hey, take this regressor and regard it as a constraint in the optimization model. So this means you have variables on the input side you have variables on the output side, you solve some mathematical optimization problem, but you add also the constraint, by the way, the input variables, the values of the input variables must be connected to the var uh, output variables, and you use that exactly like any other linear constraint. So we've, this is cutting edge uh, research, this is not in our commercial project, this is part of our open source project, so take, take a peek at that. Here's one fun <laughs> application. So you all know this number database that everyone has used for the last 30 years for uh, paper publications. So here, on, on the, you, can, you can ask yourself, if I have a regressor and I find a correctly classified picture, here's the four on the left-hand side, what is, you can ask the optimization problem then, what is the minimum perturbance I have to add to the picture so that the regressor fails? And so on the right-hand side, you see I changed a few pixels, actually not I changed, but Gorobi figured out that is the minimum change I can apply to an image so that this picture is no longer classified as a four. And of course, this, this has a name in the literature. This is adversarial machine learning, and optimization is a perfect tool to explore exactly these robustness boundaries. All right, so I hope I could convince you that mathematical optimization is a powerful industry agnostic tool, and um, Groby is in the game for helping you to solve these. Try it out, Pip and Store Group have pandas, and um, thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Lutze, for this interesting talk. Uh, we have so many questions. Um, the top voted one is, what is the cost to switch from IP op to Groby? Um, like the cost, in, the philosophical cost or money cost, yeah. So there are many metrics we have to regard. So IP opt is, um, so maybe to put it in, in the right scope. So IP opt 
is a very robust solver for local nonlinear optimization. So IP opt guarantees within the boundaries of what you can do in, in, with NOMEREX um, to find a local optimum of an arbitrary nonlinearly constrained optimization problem. Gorobi, in, uh, in contrast, guarantees that you get back a globally optimal solution. So it's a different discipline and it's hard to compare. Uh, so in terms of money, it's, it's zero uh, versus something because IPOPT is open source and Groby is not. So if that answers the question, but I want to just point out these are two different things. You cannot really compare them. Thank you. The next question is, when should I use Groby and when SciPy optimize admin? You should use SciPy optimize admin if that's most easy for you to use to get started in your project. And you, if you ever feel like, wait a minute, if I scale up my problem, this doesn't seem to work anymore, it runs forever, solution wrong, then you should give Gorobi a try whether our um, R&D team, our year-long work of the R&D team pays off by providing a faster and more robust solver than the open source uh, landscape currently provides. And then in the same line of thought, uh, what are the indicators that I should switch from an OSS solver to a commercial one like Gorobi? Yeah, ex same thing. You're reaching the boundaries of what open source servers can do for you, and you have to benefit from the years of engineering work we've put into our product, and just give it a try. Um, it's free evaluation is available, free for academia, free for non-profit anyway, so you'll find out. Okay, and then another question. I heard that commercial solvers are performing much better time-wise than non-commercial ones. Is that true? And if so, why? Okay, uh, I think it's almost the same question again. So, the, 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 so all the technology backend that, that we use, so branch and bound, linear optimization, I mean, that's all, all known. It's, I mean, you can buy a textbook and read what we do. The, the, what, dif what makes the difference is if you have an R&D team of extremely highly specialized mathematicians and computer scientists that make their living on figuring out what is the best way to implement an algorithm, what are the tricks I need to put into it to make it work in practical problems. Well, um, what you get from customer interactions. And you learn from customers, oh, that's how we do it. We should adapt our algorithm to cover that in a little better way. This is the, all these opportunities that open source servers typically do not have. Hence, we, we are typically faster and more robust than, than open source, yeah. There's another question to you, I guess, as an optimization expert, Microsoft has the term of quantum computing inspired optimization. Could this be advanced over classic optimizers? Yeah, that's an, it's, it, this is, uh, yeah, this is an interesting marketing uh, thing. I totally agree. <laughs> so here's the thing. So quantum has some um, enormous momentum, both in the, in the press and in people's minds, and I, I appreciate that. The thing is people are somehow, they start with, oh, there's quantum, maybe I can solve my problem. Then they get into reading, and they found, oh, wait a minute, but if I formulate my problem not, not as something for quantum, but you just use mathematical optimization, which exists already for 30 years, Maybe I should try that now. So maybe not, work, maybe not wait for the quantum revolution, just solve your problem today with the tools that are already there, even if they're not called quantum. Evolution is a wonderful segue to the next and last question. How is Gurobi better than SciPy optimized differential evolution? Yeah, so I have to admit, so that must refer to some um, particular method in SciPy uh, optimized, right? That one I don't know. Um, I think we're we a global MIP solver. That one doesn't sound like a global MIP solver. I think that's, that, that's the best I can answer to them for the moment, sorry. Thank you so much. Thanks.